This is this guy, this is the hypercube of dimension two n plus one. Considers the subgraph, namely the subgraph um, induced by the levels n and n plus one. And the claim is that this subgraph has at one sign on. Okay, so let me explain all the, all the terms. So we're looking at this hypercube of odd dimension by the vertices are binary strings of length two n plus one. Edges are between vertices that differ in a single bit. And we look at levels n and n plus one. So these are those vertices that have precisely n. Many ones are n plus one of them in them. And this subgraph, if you look at it as a, as a lattice, so where the subgraphs are ordered by inclusion, then these are the le two levels in the middle. And if we look at the bipartite graphs, so here's a picture. And it was one. These binary strings of length three. Level zero, level one, level two, level three. And the full cube is this. And uh, we are interested in this subgraph between levels n and n point one. The claim is it has a cycle, which in this case is just the graph itself. Yes, so this is the, the claim. And this uh, was a conjecture which was known as the middle levels conjecture. And it originated uh, in the 80s, had a long history, and probably Tom can tell us more about the history, but I will not talk about the history so much. And then eventually, after many intermediate results, seven years ago, I managed to prove this. So it's now a theorem. And today we're going to see a somehow streamlined proof that, 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 that somehow shortcuts a lot of the difficulties of the original proof and basically uh, fits onto two pages. So the, the, current, the current proof is basically like this. Yeah, it's on these two page, two page paper. And um, I have some aspects to it that I would consider beautiful and this is why I call it a book proof. Okay, so um, let's go into the proof. Um, the proof has uh, several steps, and um, first we need a little bit of notation. So obviously you're looking at a bipartite graph, and the level at the bottom, we call this set of vertices A n, and the level at the top, maybe I should write the other amount, the level at the top, we call it B n. A and B n, and we look at this bipartite graph induced by these two partition classes. This is the graph we are looking at, and uh, we want to claim we want to prove that the test Okay, so the first step. The first step is we want to find a good combinatorial interpretation for the vertices of this graph. Okay, so the first step is to interpret the purchase itself. So if it's not it's called a name, it's called an M N middle levels graph and step to interpret purchase itself and then as um as type words and type words and uh rooted trees. So in this uh, streamlined form of the book proof, what you will see is basically a sequence of magic tricks that, that lead us to the, to the goal. The first of these magic tricks is to find the right interpretation to look at these binary strings. We will look at them in terms of Catalan objects. As yeah? so Catalan objects are dive words and another Catalan objects are rooted trees. And we will interpret these binary strings as, as these kinds of objects. Okay, so let me show you how it works. We look at an example. Let's take a vertex from this set A n, somewhat randomly chosen vertex, but I will stick to the examples I have here. So let me copy it from, from the paper. Um, okay, so here's an example of such a vertex. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six ones. 
and one, two, three, four, five, six, seven zeros. Yeah, so this is a vertex from the bottom now. And the first step is we will, we will interpret these binary strings as a, as a lattice path. So for every one bit, we draw a step going up, and for every zero bit, we draw a step going down. Okay, so we go up, down, let me draw it smaller. One step up, three steps down, one, two, three. One step up, one step down, four up, one, two, four, and three steps down, two, three. Okay. What is the end point? The end point is reached, so this is the origin, yeah? The end point is reached out of two n plus one steps. Yes, so yeah, this x coordinate. And what is the y coordinate? It's uh, it's minus one because we have one more zero than, than once. This is why we end here. And now um, what we do is we look at this, we look at the at the valleys at the deepest points of this of this thing up there here. So what is the lowest the lowest tangent here? Okay. This line. And it touches this at one or more places. And you look at the leftmost of these places. And instead of looking at the string from here, you look at the string from here. Okay. Meaning you look at it from here and then you continue here. Okay. So you see this thing. And then you continue with these steps up, down, down, down. Up, down, down, down. What do you see? You see a path that stays above this red line, plus this last step going down. Yes. This is what we call the dike word. Okay. So this 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 thing. This, 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 this general vertex as a substring, which I, if you read it, it starting from the correct position. Yeah. You read it from here, then you see a substring that we call a diaper. Yeah. So let me let me write it. Um, so this um, this uh, string let's call it X which starts here, so x starts with one, zero, and so on. So it's this red box. It is x is what we call a dike bird. So bn is a dike bird length 2n. So dike bird means every prefix has at least as many ones and zeros. In terms of lattice path, it always stays above the abscissa. It goes up n times, it goes down n times. And it, in total, it has length two n, and then this is this extra zero bit in the end. So, so we can look at this y as as what as this x, which is this dike string, plus the extra zero bit, and this whole thing shifted to the right in this case by one, two, three, four steps. Yeah, so, so this arbitrary vertex, we can look at it as a dike word plus an extra bit plus some shift and the shift tells you how many steps uh, from which position you have to read to to, to see the, the type word yes in this case this is the force of so sigma is cyclic sigma it's cyclic right rotation Yes, so sigma can be applied four times. This means we reach from the fourth position to see this type work. Okay. Um, we can do the same thing for um actually I may want to continue with no, I think I'll write this here. We can do the same thing for the vertices. Uh, at the top, which are the vertices in the second class, the class B, and uh, so what's it look like? Let's take some example vertex. Let's take this vertex zero 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 one 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 zero 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 one two three four. Go over the back. Go the left is part four. 
So this, so this is now from the other level, from the top level Bn. Again, we will end up the two n plus one step, and we will end at height plus one because we have one more one than zeros. Okay, again, we look at the bottom line. And we look at the rightmost point, and we go one more step up, and we look at this thing from here. Yeah. So what do we see? We see this part, and then followed by this. So we go up, 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 and then down, 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 one, two, three, up, 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 one, two, three, down, down, down. And then this last thing going up. So again, this Y, and again, if you read it from the right place, which in this case is from here, what we see is a diagram X followed by a one bit shifted a suitable number of positions. In this case, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Yes, you agree. Okay. And in general, in general, um, in general, we will do the following. We will introduce some of the following notation. So basically. We want to look as vertices of the middle and less graph as a triple of three things. The divert plus the extra bit plus how many positions it was shifted. Yeah. So we take a divert, we take a single bit, and we take the shift. And those three things we put together, and this will be a vertex of the middle level graph. So it's a, what is it? It's take this divert x, append this bit b, and shift it as positions to the right. This is how we look at vertices of the middle level graph. Yes, and uh, and now we we give the names. So this the dikes are burnt, the, the nut which is somehow inside, and this e I don't know we call it bit, and this s we call it shift shift. Yeah. And this is a bijection. This is precisely the set of all vertices. So this set A n vertices in the bottom level. These are triples x zero s, yeah, where this extra bit is zero, and the shift is any possible value between zero and two n. And this is precisely the set of all vertices at the bottom. For every vertex, you can figure out what is this not what is this. Shift and this extra bit will be zero. And for Bn it's the same, but but with a one bit. Yeah. This is the first step. You interpret vertices of the middle level graph as these triples of things that involve these dike or these Catalan objects, in this case dike birds. So I should say this X is dike bird X. Take a diagram and a bit and shift it by the number of positions. Let me convince you that the cardinality of these sets works out. How many diagrams are there? This is the Catalan number. So this is the number of possible nuts. How many possible bits we have? Two, we does zero and one. How many possible shifts we have? Two and plus one. This should give the right number. The number of vertices of the middle level graph. What is it? Well, it's just uh, the size of A plus the size of B, which is 2n plus 1 choose n, yeah, because you have this many bits and you choose n of them. And you take it times 2 because you have two levels. And you can check that, that, that this is the right thing. This is just basically probability computation that what I'm doing is makes sense. Yeah. OK. And um, what we also do, a very useful interpretation of the of these uh, diapers, we will look at them not as diapers, but as root trees. Okay. So how do we build the rooted tree from such a diaper? Uh, we will we will grow the trees from bottom to top, and we will start with the root. And basically, what you do is you you, you squeeze this thing together and you glue 
you glue these half edges together to become single edges. And another way to say it is you start here, for every step going up, you draw an edge. And for every step going down, you just go back to, to where you came from, okay? So you draw an edge, you go back, you draw one, two, three, four edges, one, two, three, four edges. You go back three times, one, two, three, one, two, three, you draw an edge, you go back two times and you end it. So this is just squeezing this thing together and gluing it to a tree and it's a rooted tree and the root is at the bottom. Okay. We can do the same thing here. We look at this thing, we squeeze it together and we get this tree, one, two, three edges going down, one, two, three edges going down. And this is this corresponding to the tree. Okay, so, um, so these side words are over here. We look at them as rooted trees with n edges. So we have diagrams of length 2n and the gluing offset. So we have n edges. This is why it makes sense to parameterize this by n because n will be the number of edges of these rooted trees. Okay. So this is the first uh, set. Maybe I should leave here. Yeah. Yeah. I may use the other box. Okay, why not? Let's do this. Yes, you could change that. Okay. So this is the right interpretation, as we should see in the next step. So the next step is uh, ultimately we want to build a Hamilton cycle, and we do an intermediate thing, we build a cycle factor, a collection of cycles, which together visit all the vertices in the graph. And then in the third step, we will glue the cycles together to a single cycle. So let's do this intermediate cycle step. Um, we will build a cycle factor, and we will build this cycle factor by defining a bijection, which um, basically, so A and down here, and B and level up here, which which for every guy down here sets and defines what is its partner up here and, and the other way around. These will define two perfect matchings and we take the union of these two perfect matchings. This is exactly what, what you did in your papers with uh, yesterday. We will define a bijection um, F, and I will tell you the definition in a moment, but in order to define it, um, I will need some uh, auxiliary rotation, and this is the notion of tree rotation. So what is the tree rotation? So um, we are looking at a rooted tree from this set Bn, rooted tree with n edges, x in this set Bn. Any such rooted tree with n edges, we can look at it like this. It has a first edge, then, then, then sub to u, then going back and then the remaining part of the tree, which I call V. So any such tree, you can always partition it into the first edge, the rest and, and the rest. Yes. So it always has the form one, this is this, then the U, then the zero, and then the V, which is the rest. Where this U and V are just general Catalan objects, general order trees, and it's a D, which is just the union of all these D and So, like subworlds of arbitrary length, which together have to go in. Yeah, this is how I will look at that. At, at any, I can look at any such tree like this. And the tree rotation is, I call it R of X. What is the tree rotation? Well, the tree rotation just moves the root from here to, to, to here. So the tree of rotated tree will look like this. This is you and this is me, and then the root is down here. Okay, this is R of X. Okay, what is R of X? So it's it's you, then the one, then the B, and then zero. Okay, this is this is R of X. It's just a definition, and this is tree rotation. And um, with this, I now define this F. This this projection F. And uh, I define it separately for the for the guys here and for the guys here. So what is the F for those guys? So for what are vertices at the bottom levels? These are 
triples of a tree, the zero bit and some shift. And I need to say with whom do they partner in this set? And I'll define it as follows. They will just be the rotated tree and then the one bit because I'm going from A to B. And I will increase the shift by one. Okay, this is a valid level, a valid vertex from the level B. And what I claim and what I still need to show you that this, that this is just a single bit flip. It doesn't look like that, but this is what I will show you in a moment. So this is the mapping to go from here to here, which I claim just flips a single bit that I'll show you. Going down is easier. I need to go from a vertex in B, which has the one bit here, to a vertex in A, and this just flips this bit. This is easy. Okay, so I go to the same X. I flip this, make it a zero, and the S stays the same. Okay. Do you believe me that this flips a single bit? I think this is clear, right? It's just exactly this bit. This is not clear yet. So let me let me convince you that this flips a single bit. I'll make a little, little sketch here. So what is this? What is what is this vertex x zero s? Here's how it looks like. We have we have the x somewhere. Which I now interpret as a as a as a, as a tree one u zero b. So somewhere I have this this x, which is one u zero b. Then I have this extra zero bit, and and the, and the shift is 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 value s. I have the number of steps that I shifted it to the right. This is a visual interpretation of this vertex. Now I will draw this vertex here below it. So R of X. Oh, what I what I claim is it's just this bit that's being turned. So let me let me draw it. Zero. And I claim that this is exactly R of X1, S plus one. So I'm claiming that now you have to read the die curve from, from here on the next position, which is S plus one. And this is indeed. What happens? Because if you read from here, you see u one v zero. Now this is precisely r of x. Yes, you agree. So this red part here is precisely r of x. This is the one bit, and the shift has increased by one. And we just flip the single bit. So this is uh, indeed this is indeed flipping just the single bit. And uh, and uh, you can convince yourself that that is indeed a bijection. For this, you just need to write down the inverse mappings. But this is also easy. The inverse of this is basically inverse tree rotation, and the inverse of this is just let the zero back to one. So it's easy to see that it's a bijection. And um, it changes only a single bit. So um, this means. That we can build cycles from this. So, so the method, so the matching going up is is is, is a set of uh, is, is a perfect matching, and the, and the, and the mapping f uh, going from b to a is another perfect matching, and together they they form a, a bunch of cycles that defines a cycle vector. So now we can define cycles uh, for every vertex y. We can just say, okay, start with y. Then go to f of y, then go to f two of y, and so on. At some point, we will return to y. This is one cycle, and then the cycle factor of fn is just the union of all these cycles. C of y, where y is any starting vertex, either from a and or b. And so this way, we define a bunch of cycles. And the interesting thing for uh, for Tom maybe is that these two matchings here. These the matchings. These are actually the matchings that you already studied in your paper with with, with Kirsted. So these are precisely uh, the zero lexical and one lexical matchings. Uh, so it's it's nothing new, but it's somehow described in a tricky way with this with this three rotation. 
So you knew already about these uh, cycles and uh, these two cycles. They don't give m cycles, they give many cycles. Now we can interpret them in terms of these three rotations. And because what we will do now, we will now try to understand what happens if I start at a y and I apply the f going up and the second time going down. I want to understand what happens after two steps. Well, it's, it's easy. I mean, here, so what, what happens if I apply it twice? Uh, so I start at the vertex in A and I end at the vertex in B. So what, what happens? Well, I go from here to here, and then I just flip this bit. This is what happens. So what I, what I end up with is the rotated tree. The bit has become a one and a zero again, so I'm back in the same level. And the shift has increased by one. Yes. So this tells me what happens along the cycle. What happens along the cycle, two steps going along the cycle is the same as rotating the tree and increasing the shift by one. Yes. So two steps along the cycle is the same as rotate the tree and incre increment the shift. Increment the shift. Yes. So I have a precise combinatorial understanding what happens if I walk along the cycle. I just rotate the tree and increment the shift. From this, I can immediately infer what the cycles mean. What do the cycles mean? Well, walking along a cycle basically applies all the possible rotations. So the cycles are in correspondence with equivalence classes of rooted trees under rotation. Yes, so the cycles of this factor Fn. Let me just call that. Are in projection with equivalence classes of rooted trees with n edges under tree rotation. Under rotation. Yes. So, for example, let's do an example. Um, I can predict precisely the length of the cycles, the number of the cycles, what happens along the cycles, all these things I can predict. For example, if n equals four, let's say, how many cycles will I have? Well, how many trees are there with four edges? There's this tree, this tree, and uh, and the star. Yeah, so there will be three cycles, and the one will be obtained by putting the root here, or here, or here, or here, or here, but then this is the same as putting it here. The other one will be, I start here, or here, 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 We're putting the root in all these places, and here putting the root in these two different ways. So this defines the cycle. So this cycle factor will have three cycles. This will be the longest one. This will be the middle one, and this will be the shortest one. So I don't understand because you also have this uh, shift shift all that. Yes, very good which, point. Uh... Very good point. I'm trying to I try to cheat, but you you spotted it. And uh, um, what I'm claiming is that all for a particular root tree, all the shifts are in the same cycle. This is what I'm claiming. Yes. So this rooted tree with shift zero will be in the same cycle. This rooted tree with shift one, all the shifts with the same rooted tree will be in the same cycle. This is what I'm claiming. Why is it so? Um, this is the following. So the tree, the tree has n edges, and um, so, so let, let, let's assume for the moment that uh, there's, uh, so, so n edges means there's at most two n ways to put the root. So let's say there's two n rooted, um, two n rootings of the same underlying tree. In this example, 
And why are all the possible shifts of these routings in the same cycle? This is because uh, there are two n plus one possible shifts. There are two n plus one possible shifts and two n routings, and these numbers are co-prime. And this is why when doing rotation and adding the shifts plus one, I will eventually accumulate all the shifts of the same rooted tree. You see what I'm saying? Yes. And this is true more general because these number of different routings is always a divisor of 2n, t2n, and therefore it's never a divisor of this number. And this is why all the possible shifts of the same routings will always be in the same cycle. Yeah, is it convincing? So there's a divisibility argument why all the shifts of the same root entry are in the same cycle. Yes, this is what I'm claiming. So this is why, uh, why this is true. Yes, so, yeah. So there, there's different ways to get the root and different ways to put the shift, but all the ways of placing the shift are in the same cycle. Good. Uh, so we have a combinatorial interpretation of the cycles. We know how long they are, how many there are, and what it means to walk along the cycle. This, this is what we have here. And now comes the last step. We need to glue the cycles together because now we have here a, a cycle factor with three cycles, but we want a cycle factor with one cycle because we want to have the cycle. Yes. So we need to glue them together. Okay, this is the last step, third step. Blue cycles together. Okay, what do I mean by that? Um, the basic idea is the following. You have two cycles. And uh, what you're looking for is a pair of edges on those cycles, which have the property that there exists also the other pair of edges going across. If you find something like this, then what you want to do is you want to delete these edges from the cycles and instead use the other ones going across and this will glue the two cycles to one. Unfortunately, this structure requires a four cycle from which there are none in the middle level graph. The middle level graph doesn't have four cycles. So you need to do something else, uh, which I will show you now. But this is, the, it has the same effect, but it doesn't use a four cycle, but a six cycle. Okay. And again, we want to give this gluing process a combinatorial interpretation. Yeah, mm -hmm. because, say what is the gluing, but we want to interpret it combinatorially. And for this, I want to introduce the notion of what I call the pullable tree. So it's a special kind of rooted tree, which looks as follows. So down here is the root. Then there's two edges like this, and then there's a sub tree here, what we call U, and another sub tree V that is here. And the binary string representation of this whole thing is a one. One, another one, then a zero, then the U, then the zero, and then the V. Yeah, this is this is one of these like words. But this is a special tree. Not all trees have this because not all trees have this ending edge here. Yeah? So this is a special kind of tree which I call pullable tree. And to a pullable tree, we can apply what we call a pull. Um, and this we give and this tree we call P of X. So this is X. And here's P of X. P of X is obtained by putting this edge here. So let me first draw the picture. So it's the root is down here. And then there's two edges. And then the U is here. And the V is here. So this this, this edge here has changed its place, it's place. It's attached here and now it's attached here. So the, the binary representation is one zero and then one u zero, one u zero, and then v. 
So two bits change. Okay. Why is this uh, a useful concept? This this notion of bullet trees. For this I will draw a picture. We'll make it clear in hindsight why we want to look at these bullet trees. For this, we look at a vertex that has this form. And this vertex uh, has shift zero here. So we look at the vertex of the form Y where it starts with the pull of the tree of this form that we see there, plus this extra zero bit. And this thing has shift zero because we start at the beginning. But this vertex has the following form. And we wrote it there, one, one, zero u zero v this is this uh, dike part and now comes this extra zero bit at the end maybe maybe i'll put this this frame around uh, what we call the nut so this dike part of the vertex and yeah, plus the extra bit. and i will do the same thing for the vertex z which is this pull tree which is the pull tree plus uh, Plus a zero bit. So these are two vertices from the bottom. Two vertices from this set AN. So let me write it here. So how it look like? It's this pull three one zero one u zero b plus this extra zero bit and this um, box here marks again this nut this dike sub part. Okay. What I'm looking at now is the cycle in the cycle factor that starts at this vertex y. And I also look at the cycle that starts at this vertex z. So this will be the cycle c of y, and it will be the cycle c of z. So this is the y. How do I get the cycle? Well, I need to apply the f. I need to compute f of y, f2 of y, f3 of y, f4, f5, and f6. I want to follow this for six steps. And here I want to follow it only for two steps. I only want to do what is the other set. Um, and now we would need to use the definition of this F, like to, to figure out which bit is the flip. We do it six times and we write these binary strings. I will not explain each of these applications, but it's the route that I wrote down how to apply the F. I'll just write the result without each time explaining what is the bit we flip. So the first bit we flip is this one, which you can figure out if you look at this F. But in this, I think you have to trust me that I'm doing the right thing. And in the next step, we flip the first bit according to the definition of F. And then in the next step, uh, we flip for this bit. The next step, we flip here this bit. So, okay, so trust me that this is the right thing, but we can verify it easily. Um, we flip the first bit. One, one, eight, zero, and one more bit to flip. And this time we flip this bit. Zero, U. One B zero. Let me also mark the shift. We know already what happens with the shift, and which I will mark by drawing these, these dike subverts. So here, the shift uh, has increased by one, and here it's again one, and then it will be two. So now we need to start drawing these boxes from here. We always have should it should be two or three. What? You made it three now. Oh, oh sorry. Thank, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Well done. I'll spot it. Yes, the shift always increases by one. And now it goes to the next number. Yes, right. Thank you. Yes, the shift goes up by one. You can check that all of these are these nuts, these dike subwords. You can verify that we always flip a single bit. Let me, let's do this one step here. So here we just flip a uh, second bit. Okay. And the shift goes up to one. So this is the right box. Okay. So here we have a cycle. It has 
these vertices is it the first vertex, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh vertex. And uh, and it continues and then it goes around and comes back here. Yeah, so it goes around. And here we have this cycle that starts at Z, then it's F of C, and then it goes on and drops around and comes back here. And now I'm claiming that these two cycles can be glued together in the following way. Um, in this way, like this, um, like this, and like this. Okay, so what is this red thing? This red thing is a thick cycle. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yes. Why is it a six cycle? Well, you can check that between these two edges, we only fill a single bit. So for example, between these two guys, uh, they differ only in this bit. Yeah. These two guys, they differ in the third bit only. And these two guys, they differ only in the third bit. Yes. So these edges are indeed present, as you can check. This means we can use this as a gluing cycle, which means, which means we remove these edges. Yeah. The ones that are shared with the cycle C or Y and C or so. Okay, does it work? Well, let's see. We start here, okay, we go here, we go here, we go around this cycle, we come back here, go to the other side, we go backwards on this part, but who cares? We go forward and then we Pick up the rest. Okay. So it does work. Yeah. It's a bit more complicated than the full cycle going, but it still has the same effect. I can glue the two cycles together and make C of Y and C of Z a single cycle by taking the symmetric difference. Yeah. Okay, that's this, this this red thick cycle, we call it G of X, G like gluing, but it's the sixth cycle. Which is defined for this pullable tree X. So I can do this whenever I see a pullable tree X. I can find the six cycle, which allows me to join the cycle corresponding to this tree to the cycle that corresponds to this tree. Yes, the tree has been changed a little bit. And so the observation here is that C of Y plus C of Z. Symmetric difference with this gluing thing, G of X, is a single cycle on the same vertex set as the two cycles that I started with. And so I had two cycles. I take symmetric difference, I get a single cycle on the same vertex set. And now, um, aha. Now we are almost done. Well, there's a little, okay, what we want to do now is we want to basically throw in all these gluing cycles. We take the original cycle pack, we want to throw in all the gluing cycles and then argue that they make this thing connected to a single cycle. However, there's one potential complication, namely, we need to argue that these gluing cycles are disjoint. It could be that one of these red gluing cycles comes here and another one maybe comes here and then they interfere with each other and this would be bad. We need to make sure that the gluing cycles are disjoint. For this, we look at, and we, <clears throat> we claim that they are vertex disjoint. I claim that the union of all possible cycles, G of X, over all possible pullable trees, that these cycles are all vertex disjoint. It seems quite uh, surprising, but it's true. This is what I want to argue. So I claim that this set of eight vertices, which is involved here, so these one, two, three, four, five, six, nine, nine vertices, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, plus these two, that these set of nine vertices are destroyed from any other blue inside. So what are these vertices? So these are the vertices that I get from Y, by applying the F zero times up to six times, plus uh, the vertex set from and this set of nine ones. So these seven vertices plus these two, this defines a set of nine vertices. And I claim that for any two, uh, so x and x prime are two 
distinct holical trees, I claim that this implies that each of these sets are disjoint. Yes, this is the claim. This would mean that none of the gluings interfere with each other. Okay, this is the crucial, one of the crucial shortenings which make this so elegant. Um, we look at we look at the shifts of these vertices. What are the shifts? Shift is zero, zero, one, one, two, two, and three. And here the shift is uh, zero and here it's one. Yeah, so these are these shift values, these red numbers. And uh, now I look at two of these sets and I wonder how can they intersect? Well, they can only intersect if the shift values are the same because if the shift value is different, they cannot be the same. So a vertex with shift three can never be the same as a vertex of shift one because the shift is a, is a property of a vertex which, which doesn't change. So if, if I, if, okay, so assume, so, so assume that there is something in the second the intersection. So if this intersection is not empty, where can the collisions lie? It can only be collisions between guys that have the same shift. Yes. And you also have to remember that you alternately visit vertices from A and from B. So this is a vertex from the set A and I call it an A vertex. And this is a vertex from the set B and it always alternates. So if you, this is A and this is B vertex. So if two guys collide, they have to be both from A or both from B and they have to have the same shift value. Otherwise they can't collide. So what are the possible collisions between these numbers? It can be the, the only numbers that repeat here are the zeros and, and the ones. So if they match, and the, and the A's and B's have to match. So either this S of X is this, and the S prime is this, or uh, yes, so there's only three possible options. Either the collision is in this vertex between both cycles. So this would mean that x is x prime, which we ruled out because we assumed that we take two distinct political trees. So these two cycles, they can never overlap in this vertex because it's the same thing. But they could overlap in this one. That this is the starting vertex of one side, and this is the starting vertex of the other. So or or it could be that the x is the same as the pulled tree from x of y, or the other way around, pulled of x is the same as x prime. Yeah, so this would mean that this vertex is the same as this of the other guy or the other way around. Yes, these are the only possible collisions. Like if these two sets intersect, then it's one of these three cases. This case can't be because we have chosen two different trees. And this can't be because a vertex like this has a one here and the pulled one has a zero here. So these two vertices can never be the same. Yes, so this is also without. out. These vertices always have a one in the second bit and these vertices always have a zero in the second. So they cannot be the same. Okay, so this shows that the are vertex is joined. Can you show me that? Yes. This is this argument. Okay, so how do you roll out the second on the right? This argument E1. Yes, and third on the left, which is uh -huh. also E1. Yes. Um what you would do in this case, um what you would do in this case, um Um, let me see. Um, let me see. Very good question. Um, so, so the first bit is different. And the first bit is different. Uh -huh. uh -huh. um, what you would do is okay, if, if, if they overlap, then, then also they would overlap. 
and uh, and they have but they have different shifts. Yes. So two things two things overlap. If, if these overlap, then 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 this fixes all all the guys that I reach by applying f or f minus one. So then they would overlap, and that's, this can't because this is zero and this is one. Yeah, so these are the only possible intersections. Okay. Um, okay, so all the gluings are disjoint. So we have the cycles, they correspond to the entries. We have the gluings, they, they are help us to glue together pairs of trees that differ in the pool. And we can use all the gluings together because none, no two of them interfere with each other. And now we just need to put everything together. Okay. So how do we know that C of Y is different from C of Z? Um, well, they differ in the second bit, right? Are the cycles? Ah, this we don't know. Yes, you're right. Yes, you're right. So uh, we didn't assume that these are distinct cycles. So it could be that you have like one cycle and the six cycle goes in between these two, but then we'll never use this one. Yes, we don't care. We never use gluings between things that are already one. Yes. We can allow such gluings. But we'll never use them. Yes. The same. The same will happen now over and over again. There will be, I don't know, if you have two cycles and you have a six cycle here and another six cycle here, then you'll use only one of them because after using one, these two cycles will have become one, not in a simplified way. So after taking the first one, these are now one, and then you won't use this anymore. Yes. A good question. Okay. Now we're almost there. Okay, so we want to prove basically prove that every cycle of our cycle factor can be glued to every other cycle of the factor, can be glued to every other cycle, to every other cycle, by a sequence of suitable gluings, sequence of suitable gluings, because this implies that everything can be joined to everything else, and then we're done. And this we now do combinatorially. So what are the cycles? I can now do two, I want to start at the cycle, and I want to prove that by a sequence of these flowing steps, I can reach any other cycle. And I cannot do two things. I can either walk along the cycle or I can use a glowing jump to the next one. Yes. And um, this I will do combinatorially. So I can do two things walk along the cycle, walk along the cycle. This is what does it mean? It means applying tree rotations. Yes. Apply a tree rotation. This is what it means to follow along a cycle. And uh, use a gluing cycle means apply a pull operation. Yes, this is what it means combinatorially. Okay, so start at your favorite cycle, your favorite rotor tree. And I will do an example now. Let's say and I try to make it a bit general. I don't know, maybe this three. One, two, three, four, five, six, eight, 14. So 14 edges, so n is 14. We want to move to any other tree. So this is the rule sign here. Uh, and it's enough to prove that we can reach one particular tree, which will be the star. So what we show is we can always reach the star. Yeah, so this is a special target cycle or target tree. If we can join everything to this guy, then everything is connected. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So here's down down here's the root. I can walk along the cycle. This means three rotations. So 
Uh, what I will do, I will use my finger. So this is the root. Okay, the root is here. So tree rotation means uh, the root moves. Um, where's the picture? The root moves in like clockwise. So the root moves here. Yeah. So if I apply a tree rotation, the root moves here. And I, I could now redraw the tree, but I won't do it. I'll just keep my finger here. I can walk along the side here. This would be one thing. And I, or I can do this pull. But I want to get closer to this guy. So what I do is the following. I fix an arbitrary vertex. Let's say, um, let's say this one. And what I measure is, I call it B. Let's call this 3x. And it's the sum of distances of all nodes from this chosen vertex, which I call C. Distances from a fixed vertex C, fixed vertex C. So I fix a vertex C once and for all. This will become the center vertex of the star, by the way. This will be finally the center vertex. And I want to do pulls and rotations that move all these leaves closer to C. I will decree on to decrease this quantity in one step and then I repeat. Okay. What do I do? Well, I look at the C. I look at the subtrees that come out of the C. If the subtrees are single edges, then, then I'm done. I don't need to do anything. If the subtree coming out of the C is not a single edge, but something longer, then I can do something to it. So I pick one of these things that is not a single edge. And I want to apply a pull to it. So I look at this subtree. I look at the leftmost leaf, leftmost in the sense of, well, clockwise looking. It's this edge. And this edge, I want to pull and bring it closer to, to this center vertex. Okay, so what I, and for this to apply, I need the root to be here. So I do rotations until the root is in distance two from this leaf that I want to pull. And then I do a pull. So I take it away. And uh, put it here. This means I won't went along the cycle and jump one step to the next cycle. And what happened to this quantity? Well, it, it went down. I reached a new tree, x prime, which has now one less uh, this quantity. Yes. And now you can repeat. Uh, in the next step, you will pull this guy. You will pull it here. You can do it in arbitrary order. You can. You also at some point have to pull these guys. These guys. Uh, you do it one by one. To pull them next to each other. Maybe, maybe let's do a few more steps. Okay, so next thing, let's say we pick. So from now we look from here and we pull this guy. Let's say yeah? so we pull it one step closer. Pull it again. Okay, now this one is done. We'll never touch this one again. And now we we'll pull this one. So okay. now you repeat all the guys. They they come closer with every pull to this fixed center vertex C. So after finally many steps, you reach the star. And this is why this thing is connected. And this is the end of the proof, basically. So, OK, this last part was a bit visual, but hopefully convincing. Uh, so it works with these trees and this quantity that decreases some of distances, which gets smaller as soon as you apply a pool. And this is the end of the proof. So thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>